Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Art Horn. Uh, Mr. Horn has been a practicing attorney here in Memphis for the past 13 years. Uh, before becoming a lawyer, he grew up in Marshallville, Georgia, and from there he went to Eastern Michigan University where he obtained his bachelor's degree. Upon obtaining his bachelor's degree, he then went to the University of Arkansas School of Law and graduated from there. Um, since then, he's, he's opened up his own partnership, Horn and Wells PLLC. Uh, that was opened in August of 2002 here in Memphis. Uh, his practice areas include uh, various areas of civil litigation, including uh, personal injury, wrongful death, premises liability, business litigation, class action work, as well as representing criminal defendants in both federal and state court. Um, Mr. Horn has represented several high-profile clients throughout his career. Um, some of the most prominent ones include uh, Southern rapper Mario Yogati Mims, a.k.a. the King of Memphis, um, in association with the Memphis nightclub shooting. Um, Monique Johnson, in the infamous murder in Memphis case, which was actually um, uh, chronicled by Snapped, which you may have watched on the television network Oxygen. Um, he's also represented Mr. Craig Petties, uh, who was the head of an international drug syndicate, convicted of murder, bribery, trafficking, and a man commonly associated with the Sinaloa cartel. Um, perhaps more importantly, Mr. Horn is the father of three daughters um, and is a member of many organizations. Uh, he's the chairman of the Big Brothers and Sisters Club here in Memphis, a member of the American Inns of Court, and was elected as one of the uh, Memphis Business Journal's top 40, uh, under 40. Um, today, Mr. Horn will be discussing the concept of uh, blended sentencing in Tennessee courts. So without further ado, I introduce Mr. Art Horn. Good afternoon. Y'all can hear me? We got all this high tech stuff. Um, I wanna first, uh, I wanna first thank uh, the Dean of the Law School, um, Nia Badini, who worked very diligently on this law review article with me, Sandy Newcomb. Um, I saw a text from Maya, Naya to Sandy. She said, I was a nightmare. And I've been a nightmare to work with because I do have a busy schedule. And they've been wonderful, fantastic, and represented the University of Memphis Law School very well, very well. Um, one, of the, one of the cases that I had was a, a young man by the name of Preston Williams. And, and you may remember this, where there were, I think, three or four kids at East High School. And they were, um, they were National Honor Society members, members of the East High School football team, members of the East High School track team. And my client in particular, Preston, uh, had 18 scholarship offers to different universities and colleges for either track, uh, football, and, and academics. Um, never been in any trouble, none of the boys. And on this one particular day, their senior year of high school, they decide that they're gonna go out to Oak Court Mall and commit a robbery with a BB gun. So they get in the car and they go out to Oak Court Mall and one of the boys urges Preston Go do it, man. Go do it, man. He urges him. Preston jumps out of the car with this BB gun, and he robs, holds an innocent woman at gunpoint, takes her wedding ring, some jewelry, and a cell phone, 
and they drive off. Well, obviously, they get caught. It makes the news, and nobody can understand it because Preston comes from a two-parent family. His mother's an educator. His father's an educator. And this behavior is just very unusual for any of these young men. The unfortunate part of it is they're close to being the age of 18, and many of you that practice in juvenile court and, 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 and know this, the state of Tennessee wants to transfer these young men to be tried as adults. And it's a horrible thing they did. They terrorized this woman. They went to another, two of the other boys went to another mall, committed multiple robberies. Um, and so, obviously, they were transferred to be tried as an, as an adult. And in Tennessee, He comes out of the room and he says, you know what, I'm going to help Preston out. I'm going to reduce it to simple robbery and I'm going to put him on six years probation. And we get in the courtroom, the judge is scratching his head because he doesn't want to accept the offer. Um, but we talked to the victim, she was on board, we explained the type of person Preston was. And so the story goes, Preston gets probation and I told Mike McCusker, you'll never see this young man again. I told the judge that. And I saw Preston recently at Lifetime. And he now has graduated from the University of Memphis, where he ran track, was an RA, and now works for a tech company. But had, had this young man not be given, had been given the opportunity, he'd be still locked up today. So that was one of the impetuses behind us coming up with this idea to write this paper. Uh, Judge Michael, who Sandy works for also, I know supports this idea and, and, and I think pushed Sandy to do uh, uh, this paper as well. And I think, I think Nye and I ended up uh, doing it. So without, with that being said, <laughs> I'll get into the presentation. Blended sentencing in Tennessee courts, Arthur Horn and Nye Badini. Tennessee particularly with cases involving weapons. Uh, juvenile offenders are automatically being transferred to criminal court to be tried as an adult. There's a continuum of sanctions versus a continuum of re rehabilitation. The juvenile court, in its essence, was set up to rehabilitate juveniles. Uh, and so you've got the judges are faced with this, you know, balance of, you know, do we punish, do we re rehabilitate, what do we do? In many cases, uh, which I've been involved in, uh, in an attempt to keep the judges from transferring uh, the juveniles to be, to be tried as an adult, I will create a mitigation package. In the case of Preston, I had all of his accolades, his grades, um, letters of support from people in the community, um, letters from his teachers, uh, scholarship offers, scholarship letters, those sorts of things. Uh, although in Tennessee, Although Tennessee is making improvements in the area of juvenile transfer, we believe additional reform must be made. Um, eliminating the system is not an option because we've got to have a system in place to re rehabilitate our youth. In Tennessee, the juvenile court has exclu exclusive juris original jurisdiction over an alleged uh, delinquent child under the age of 18. Uh, the more serious offenses, such as first-degree murder, second-degree murder, attempted murder, rape, aggravated rape, aggravated or especially aggravated uh, robbery, kidnapping, aggravated or especially aggravated kidnapping, or the attempt to commit any of these offenses, a juvenile offender can be transferred to be tried as an adult at any age in Tennessee. A lot of states it has to be 16. In Tennessee, it's any age. On the, on the more serious offenses, uh, for a juvenile offender to be tried as an adult, 
Um, the juvenile court must follow the Tennessee Code, Section 37.1.134. Step one is they have to have reasonable grounds to believe the child committed the offense, and they have to consider the interests of the community. Um, the court considers various enumerated factors in making these findings, the child's poor prior criminal history, their uh, rehabilitative response to past treatment, whether the offense was against property or person, the aggressive nature of the offense, and the potential, potential success of rehabilitative services that are available to that child. In Tennessee, we have once an adult, always an adult, which means that if, if they are transferred as a juvenile, um, if they pick up any offenses, even while they're still a juvenile, they'll be tried as an adult. Why is reform necessary in Tennessee? Um, the Supreme Court touched on uh, it in Roper versus Simmons and Graham versus Florida, and they said that the uh, juveniles have constitutional rights, and they drew up the distinction between the cognitive abilities and the moral culpability of juveniles and adults. There's studies, there's science there that says, hey, you know, a juvenile doesn't have the same mental or cognitive capacity as, as, as we do as adults. Um, some people may agree, agree with that, some people may disagree with it, but we can't disagree with the science. Juveniles age 15 or younger are significantly more likely than older adolescents and young adults to be impaired in ways that compromise their ability to serve as competent defendants in a criminal proceeding. I see um, many uh, of my colleagues in here that are criminal defense uh, lawyers, and, and they, they'll understand this concept in that a lot of times when you're dealing with juveniles, one of the, your biggest problems is getting them to tell you what happened and getting them to tell you the truth, okay? Because they're worried about what mama's going to think, what daddy's going to think, how am I going to get out of that, because that's what children do. So as a defense lawyer, it's a nightmare because how can you adequately prepare a defense for somebody and you don't really know what happened, right? Or the child doesn't understand the significance of what they put themselves in or the situation that they put themselves in. Judge Michael will tell you we see it all the time. Pulling the truth out of a 15-year-old is very difficult, okay? Um, Tennessee does not distinguish between juveniles under the age of 16, but allows for transfer to criminal court when the, when the offender is charged with the more serious offenses that I've already touched on. Many of the studies have debunked the myth that treating juvenile offenders like adults deter them from committing more crimes. That's a farce. It doesn't. It doesn't. Getting tougher on crime, locking them up, putting them away, throwing away the key, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. The studies have shown it doesn't work. So we've got to come up with something better, a better way to try to deal with our juveniles. And, and again, the foundation of the juvenile justice system has always been rehabilitation. And you'll see the studies. The reality is once they become uh, once they're bound over and they're put in adult jails, they're exposed to all the madness. And you'll see they're more likely to commit suicide, eight, eight times more likely to commit suicide, five, five times more likely to be sexual assault, sexually assaulted. They're taken advantage of because of their age and, and, the, and their youth. And almost twice as likely to be attacked with a weapon or inmates or beaten by staff. They're not prepared for the adult jail. They're just not. And they don't know what they're getting themselves into. The DOJ came to, to Memphis and they did an investigation on our juvenile court. And they said that we needed to make some changes. One of the things that they found was that the transfer hearings failed to meet the requirements of due process and the requirements of Tennessee law. Um, and, and, and you'll see in, under inadequate transfer hearings, automatic transfers, 99% of the children recommended for transfer were actually transferred. So what does that tell you? There's very little chance that you have as a defense lawyer to make the argument that, hey, judge, you need, we need to t take a, a second look at this child. We need to 
keep this child in the juvenile court system. Um, and part of that, part of that is Tennessee, the way it's set up now, the, the juvenile court only has jurisdiction until they're 18. So if they commit offense at 17 and a half, you've only really, the judge really only has six months to try to rehabilitate this, this youth. And if it's a, an offense like aggravated robbery, which they face, they're facing eight years as an adult, they're going to get transferred. I mean, that's the likelihood. The DOJ investigation also found that the magistrates often fail to make a meaningful inquiry into probable cause by not allowing defense witnesses to, to testify, failing to consider the social factors under 30, Section 37.1, 134B, failing to determine whether the juvenile defender was committable to an institution, failing to hold hearings altogether, and soliciting admissions of guilt before announcing transfer decision. So in, 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 in reality, what was happening is you had your client or my client had to make a confession before the judge would allow you to argue that the, that the juvenile court should keep jurisdiction or get into the, the argument of why that child shouldn't be transferred. So that creates, that creates a little dilemma as a defense lawyer because, hey, if I know my client is going to get transferred, 99% of them are getting transferred, why am I going to let him make an admission on the record in open court when I know he's going to be sent down to 201 Poplar and tried as an adult. It's problematic. Do y'all see the, the problem we run into? Racial uh, disproportionality in the transfer decisions. This is huge. Um, and I think the DOJ touched on it. We touch on it in our paper. But the data from the Tennessee Juvenile Courts reveal that transfer laws in Tennessee are, are being used disproportionately. Um, the state of Tennessee annual juvenile court statistical report shows that minority youth are overrepresented at all stages of the juvenile process. And the overrepresentation is at its highest in the rate of the juvenile transfers to adult court. So it starts when they're picked up and they're arrested and they're not Mirandized and their parents aren't allowed to come in and, 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 and sit with them when they're giving statements to police. You're talking about somebody that's 15, 16 years old. And they're going to tell the police what they want to hear, thinking that they're going to go home with mama. And then it goes on. And, and the way the system was set up before, I, I know that there have been some reforms now, but they would even sometimes make statements to their counselors, admissions to their counselors, without being Mirandized. That's problematic. As a defense lawyer, it's very problematic for us. Uh, because you see, again, there's a balance there. We want to promote rehabilitation of our juveniles, but you also don't want to walk on their constitutional rights. Because as you saw, the, courts, the Supreme Court's already expanded, really, the constitutional rights of juveniles. Um, the DOJ investigation conclusively established that black children are more likely to be recommended for transfer uh, than white children. They also find that the higher odds of a black child being subject to recommendation for transfer were not explained by the introduction of other variables. So there, there weren't, in, in, in their report, there weren't other variables to show why this, di this disproportionality existed. That's problematic. It's very problematic. Blended sentencing proposal. So what, we're, what we propose is we propose that Tennessee should adopt Blended sentencing. What is blended sentencing? Um, it has nuances, but in an effort to provide a middle ground between those who believe uh, in the rehabilitative power of juvenile court and those who maintain that the juvenile system has become too soft, um, we believe this proposal is the most sound proposal to reform the Tennessee system. And we want the state of Tennessee to, one, adopt juvenile blended sentencing, and two, adopt criminal blended sentencing. Juvenile blended sentencing, it extends the jurisdiction of the juvenile court by allowing the juvenile court to impose a suspended adult sentence. Um, if the juvenile offender complies with the juvenile sanctions and does not commit any new offenses, then the adult system sentence is suspended and the offender is released without a stain on his criminal record. So let's take the story of Preston Williams that I told you about. 
Judge Michael, Preston goes before Judge Michael under our proposal, Judge Michael can say, all right, Preston, we're going we're gonna to impose an adult sentence on you, and we're going to hang this sentence over your head until you're 21, okay? If you do everything you're supposed to, you go to college, you make good grades, you don't get rearrested, you become a pillar of, of this community and you do what you're supposed to, at age 21, we're going to dismiss this case and you don't have this felony following you around the rest of your life. Okay? And I'll get to the, the age requirements further down, I think, that we talk about it. If a juvenile offender complies with the sanctions and doesn't commit any new offenses, then the adult sentence is suspended and he's released without a stain on his record. Uh, we believe that uh, the juvenile court blended jurisdictions should be extended to the age of 21. Right now, a dilemma of this that, that, that the courts face is that when they're 17 and a half, they've really only got, what, six months to try to rehabilitate this youth. If we extend it to 21, that gives them more time. It gives them more time to hang this over their head for them to do right. At the termination of the juvenile sanction, the juvenile court would have a hearing to determine the disposition of the suspended adult sentence. So at the age of 21, they would come back to court, the judge or, or the, the, the uh, uh, counselor would make a report to the court. If they did everything they were supposed to, the case would be dismissed, their juvenile record is closed. The offenders under the age of, of 16 who are subject to transfer should automatically, automatically be adjudicated under the blended sentencing statute. So regarding any, any other offenders, this court should use a blended sentencing scheme as an alternative to transfer and thus remove the stain of the criminal justice system from transfer eligible juveniles. So again, what we're saying is instead of having this transfer hearing, we use a blended sentencing statute for the person that's 16 that goes out and commits an aggravated robbery. This would not altogether eliminate the possibility of transfer as an option um, to the adult court. That would still be available upon the completion of the juvenile disposition. Um, the extended period under the juvenile court supervision, supervision wedded with the su suspended adult sentence satisfies both the believers in the rehabilitation paradigm and the other paradigm that that we should be serious uh, and be tougher on, on juveniles and crime. Criminal blended sentencing, I, I kind of see it as you get, you're giving the judges more freedom and may, really two bites at the apple. So let's say you, and, and I'm, try, I'm talking in real terms, let's say you, you get a, a judge that is more conservative or more harsher in, this, in, in, in the way he hands down sentences at juvenile court. Well, if we adopt the criminal blended sentence, if, he, if that child is still transferred to be tried as an adult, the criminal blended sentencing laws allow the criminal court judge to prosecute juveniles in the adult system while imposing sanctions that would be available exclusively in juvenile court. So as of right now, we have, I call it, uh, it's a reverse waiver law that's never used. I call it the Judge Turner law, where if you're a non-lawyer, <coughs> And, and, and you rule on a, a transfer hearing and you transfer a child to, to criminal court, uh, as, as a lawyer, you have 10 days to, to appeal that uh, decision and, and ask that the, the child be uh, brought back to juvenile court. Um, that's the only reverse uh, waiver law that, that's in effect right now. Um, the adult court, as it stands, cannot remand a juvenile case to, ju uh, to juvenile court. The criminal blended sentencing provision would give the judge one more chance to take into account the each into account each individual case and alleviate the harsh consequences of the transfer laws. So affording the criminal court jurisdiction to impose a juvenile disposition would thus serve as an additional failsafe uh, and might further reduce the racial disproportionality in the transfer rates. So you give. So in theory, what you're saying is, okay, the child still gets transferred to be tried as an adult. Well, he gets, he gets a judge um, in criminal court, and that judge says, hey, you know what? In Preston's case, this young man 
has been accepted to college. He's on the right path. Let's give him another chance before we give him the, the, ultimate, the ultimate letter F, right? The felon, the, the, that stamp that he has to carry around for the rest of his life. In conclusion, um, what we believe is that Tennessee should follow the example of many states. Um, different states have adopted different forms of blended sentencing. We believe Tennessee, again, should adopt both the juvenile blended sentencing and the criminal blended sentencing. Uh, we need a different approach in dealing with young people. Uh, and you'll see Tennessee created its juvenile justice center system to provide for care, protection, and the wholesome mental and, phys mental and physical development of children to remove children from committing delinquent acts, the consequences of criminal behavior by substituting a program of supervision, care, rehabilitation, and to protect the constitutional and legal rights of our youth. So that's it. Um, that's what we're proposing. Uh, we think that this is a good idea. We think Tennessee needs to adopt it. Uh, we think that Tennessee needs to adopt some form of blended sentencing um, because, again, you've seen the, the, if you haven't seen the DOJ report, I would, I would ask that you look at it and read it um, and understand it. All right, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? No questions? All right. Okay. Uh, Art, you know, uh, the state of Tennessee is going to be difficult. They have to be a statutory change. Correct. And with the situation with the Attorney General's office, the sentencing would have to be recommended by the district attorney. A lot of the crimes you prefer uh, are zero tolerance and no deal. That, uh, oh. And then again, you've got to get, in the event you plead the client guilty to the court, you've got the court to go along with the plea on an aggravated charge. How, how do you address those three? Difficult barriers to overcome. Well, I mean, that, that's in the article. One of the things that I address from a real perspective is that's, a, that's one of the dilemmas that we face as defense lawyers. Um, so I think, I think one, you've got you to have a DA's office, a district attorney's office that buys into the concept of blended sentencing. Two, buys into the concept that, that rehabilitation is, it takes a serious approach to really rehabilitating our youth. Um, and and that, that's something that I had, have always expressed was a problem for me of having these sort of umbrella policies that say, hey, if somebody does this crime, we're going to recommend transfer and that's it. That's just our policy. Because I think, as, as you all know as lawyers, I mean, every case is different. And, you sh and, and every case should be judged on its own merit and you should look at every case on a case-by-case -case, uh, situation. So I think, I think what you're saying is true. You've got to get the DA's office to buy into it. Um, I, I think from your perspective as a judge, it gives you more discretion um, to, and more power. And that's, that's sort of what we believe where the power lies in, in, in the blended sentencing is that it gives the judge more of power and authority to do the right thing, which is to try to rehabilitate our youth. Um, many times we're, you know, we're in court. And there are kids that we can save, and they're not being saved because what happens is you know they're going to get transferred. Their mama wants them home, right? So we weigh the transfer hearing, and we get them a low bond so their mama can get them out. And, and then they're, what? They're in, the, they're in the adult system. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's a real dilemma. And I think, you know, the DA, DOJ coming in and doing what they've done, has obviously caused some reforms, and that's good, but I think we need more. I think we definitely need more in Tennessee. Any? Okay.